God, in the presence of the living God. Saints of God, I want to call your attention to our scripture lesson for today found in the, the book, 2 Samuel chapter 9. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, I want to read the 13 verses included. If you don't have a Bible left yours in the car, just raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. Amen. We want you to have that. Amen. We got our Wi-Fi fixed, so if you want to use your phone, amen. Whatever it takes to get you to the Word. Amen, 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 amen. If you have it, say amen. amen. Hear then these words. David asked, is there still anyone left of a house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of a house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and he was summoned to David. The king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service. The king said, is there anyone remaining of a house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, there remains a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. The king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. David said, Mephibosheth, he answered, I am your servant. David said to him, do not be afraid. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. He prostrated himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. But your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. Mephibosheth said, ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house came, became Mephibosheth's servant. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Show me your word. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Lord God, have your way with your word and with your people. Give us an anxiousness to hear from you. Give us a burning desire, a hunger, and a thirst for your truth and your righteousness. Remove us from self and preference. Remove us from the voice and the timbre and tremble of the preacher's voice. We want to hear what the Lord has to say to God's people. Is there a word from the Lord? And Lord, we all stand needing and pleading for forgiveness for we all fall short. But, Lord, we want to give you thanks, honor, and glory. And let this preaching moment be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Forgive me of my sins that I may preach your word without pretext, without any sense of ownership, but knowing that, Lord, you use and choose who you will. And we'll give you praise, honor, and glory in all that we do say and hear. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. Amen. I want to thank the ushers today. Let those who are coming please come and be seated. I, I want to say just a couple of words and, uh, of appreciation and remind them this has been a very difficult week for our church. We've lost members, uh, had a homegoing service on Thursday and Friday and on yesterday. Uh, I received an email that one of our long-term members, Brother Raymond Hamilton, 
has gone to be with the Lord. For those of you who uh, are new, that name uh, may not resonate, but for those of you who've been here for a long time, uh, a great man of God who's loved this church and cared for this church and given his life in this church until he was no longer able to be with us physically, for his presence we are grateful. Amen? But I'm also mindful of those persons who came on Wednesday night, ushers, so that we could be here for the family during the wake, for those persons who are in the kitchen preparing food, for those families, they don't get paid. They just get a call from the pastor who's saying, we have someone, and they say, Pastor, how many, uh, what do we need to do, what colors do we need to decorate, how do we uh, prepare a family room, what do we do for all of those persons, for the ushers, thank you for the choirs that come out in the work week, and sometimes there's just a few of our, our retired persons who are able to be here with us. I am grateful for your presence. You don't know what it means to a family to know that his church family cares about them in these kinds and of times and situations. It means a lot. To those of you who are members of this congregation, who, who make, it your, make your best effort to come to home goings for members of this congregation, whether you know them or not, because you want to be a visible reminder that none of us are alone who've given ourselves to the Lord. I want to say thank you to you. It means so much. Sometimes we only think about, well, I don't know that person. We just kind of move about. God knows. Let me tell you, one of us will be next. Don't look at your neighbor. It could be you. One of us will be next. And whatever you would want for your family, whatever you would want, offer that to the brothers and sisters who are here in the life of the church. And I just want to say thank you because it means so very much. Amen? I want to preach today at the table. I want to preach about this communion table. I want to preach about what happens here, uh, not just in the, in the physical act of coming and walking around and taking the wafer and the cup, but I want you to remember you have been invited and you are the special guest of the king of the universe. You are the special, uh, just, you are the, the, the focus of God's attention. How many of you have ever been invited to a fancy meal? Anybody ever been invited to a meal with the Queen of England? <laughs> it, it would look something like what you see on the screen. Now, they would already have predetermined where you are going to sit. The most important people sit closest to the Queen. And the farther away you are, but that's all right, at least you got the invitation, right? Uh, and, 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 and then just think about if Barack invited you to the White House, like he did Angela Merkel and Abe, the president of Japan. And, and, and there he is, and to his right is the chancellor of, of Germany, across from him the premier of Pakistan, and, and, and Abe, who is uh, uh, the, the leader of Japan, they're all at the table, and the closer you are to the president, are you with me? You know, we wouldn't even know how to act. We wouldn't know which fork to pick up, because they got like 13 of them, eight different glasses. You know. It's hard to feel welcome when you don't feel comfortable, when you don't feel that the invitation is there. But if you win, you get you a, a napkin to take home with you. And that invitation, you never let that go. You, you laminate that. You, you'd have that and you just touch it with white gloves. You know, that was a time I was at the meal with President Barack. Oh, you don't believe me, do you? Let me show you. Right. But every time you come to this table, at that table, Jesus sits. And he doesn't invite you to sit at the end of the table. Jesus says, this seat is available and waiting for you. Can you imagine that? 
Can you imagine God himself inviting you and me to the table? The reason it's so hard for me to put my mind around it is because I know me. I know there's nothing special about me. I know that there's nothing unique about me. I know I haven't obtained anything. I'm not the head of a country. I'm not so this, that, and the other. Why would God invite me there? It, it, it's because of what Jesus has already done on our behalf. When Jesus gave his life for you and me, he was standing in our stead and making us worthy to come to the table and sit down and eat with God. At the table of Jesus, you are welcome. You don't have to have money. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to be in church all of your life. You are invited to come to the table and sit down with Jesus. I mean, you write that, man, this Barack sitting right here by me. I'm, you know, you're trying to sneak a little picture because ain't nobody going to believe you. You're trying to, look here. You don't want to ask him for a selfie, but you sure do want to have something to make folk believe that you were in the presence of the president. There ought to be a little Holy Ghost in you. Every time you come to the table, there ought to be a little Holy Ghost get on you so that when you leave, folk will know you've been at the table with Jesus. You've been made different. Something's different about you because you've been at the table in the presence Jesus. The story of David and Mephibosheth reminds me of the grace of God and what it means to sit at the table of God. Let me teach for just a moment. Mephibosheth is the grandson of Saul. Saul is the first anointed king of the nation of Israel, and his son Jonathan is next in line. Both of them have been slain in battle, either at the enemy's hand or their own hand, and the house of Saul has fallen. And in ancient times, when a king fell, the way you made sure there was no problem is you killed all of his relatives, particularly the male relatives. You killed them so that none of the people who were looking to that house would be able to say, you're not the real king. There's a child. There's a grandchild. There's someone who is the real king. And so if you read uh, from chapter 9 through chapter 21, you'll find that seven of the sons of Saul were killed and laid out in the open you'll find that Jonathan's brother Ishboel was laying in his house and his own men came in, stabbed him, decapitated him, and took his head back to David. And said, David, we're on your side now. It was a bloody, gory time. In that time of fear for what would happen with David coming to the throne, the Bible says in the fourth chapter, second Samuel, that the nurse of Mephibosheth grabbed him to run away to try to save his life. But she stumbled and fell, injured his spine, and he was crippled from that moment on, and he was relegated to living in a place called Lodabar. Somebody say, teach, Pastor. See, eight of y'all knew this, but the rest didn't. I'm just trying to get us all together so we know the story. We, we know what's happening around this table. Listen to what happens. Sometimes in life, Life starts off promising. It looks like it's going to go a certain way. Looks like everything is lined up. You're the grandson of the king. Your daddy is going to be king. You're the firstborn child of your daddy. One day, you're going to, everything is going your way. But life doesn't work out the way we want it to work out. Well, we fell in love. We knew we'd be together forever. It was our intent. It was our goal. But life happens. You, you got the job of your dream. You, you were going on your way, but the price of all went down, and, and they decided that they, life has a way of changing on us, sometimes in the cruelest of ways. And so this child is, is injured, and then this child is living in a place called Lodabar. It's in the Transjordan. It's just south of the Sea of Galilee on the east side of the Jordan River. And listen, it's the home territory of Saul. 
It's where Saul lived and grew up. And there would be people who would be fans of Saul. And yet he goes to a place called Lodabar. Somebody say, what does Lodabar mean? I'm glad y'all interested. Listen, Lodabar means the place of nothing. It means desolation. It means a place of no bread. It means a place where there is nothing, no hope. Here's a child born into the royal palace that's unable to go out, living in a place where he just wants to disappear. He doesn't want to be noticed. He doesn't want David to even know where he is because he believes his life is in danger. All right. Let me try to piece this together. Many of us have lived in Lodabar when you've been desperate, when you've been broken. You ever been in a place where you don't want anybody to contact you? You don't want them to write you, call you, ring your bell? Just don't bother me. I, I just want to go away. I, I don't want to be bothered with the old friends and the old way of life. I'm just hurt and broken, and I just want to get up every day, pay my bills, go back to my house, not bother anybody, not be bothered by anybody. I just want to disappear. Because you're tired of church, and you're tired of this, and you're tired of that, and you just want to make it from day to day. That's where he is. But he's no different than us saints. We find ourselves where we, no matter what we have, no matter what we could have had, we find ourselves looking at our hands and we have nothing. We have nothing that means anything in this world. And David comes and he calls for Ziba. He says, Ziba, listen to this. Is there still anyone left in the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Oh, I know what the rules are. I should kill every one of them. But I remember my relationship with Jonathan. I remember how we used to play together and sing together, how we would hunt together, how we became such close friends. And I promised him that no matter what God did for me, I would take care of his household. So can I do something for Jonathan's sake? Not mine, but for Jonathan's sake. Can I show him God's kindness? Not because of, of him, but because of Jonathan. Now, now listen, me. follow me here. The reason you are invited to the table isn't because of you. It isn't because of me. God looks beyond our faults. God looks beyond our sin. God looks beyond our brokenness. And God sees Jesus in you. Oh, let me say it another way. I'm going to say it about three ways because I want you to get this. Listen, when... Mephibosheth sat at the table. When David looked over at him, I believe he said, you look just like your daddy. You, 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 you remind me of Jonathan. You, you, your, your mannerisms, the way you look, the way you smile re reminds me of your father. When somebody sees you, there ought to be a little remembering of Jesus that's on the inside. Oh, Y'all need to catch up with me. Listen. If you have been saved by the blood of Jesus, if you are born again, baptized, believer, there ought to be a little Jesus that shows up in you. Folk ought to see some Jesus in you. They ought to hear some Jesus. They ought to see it in your mannerisms. All right. I'll give y'all a couple examples of what I mean. Periodically, I take my daughter's over, one of my daughters over off West Park uh, to an African hair braiding place. Are you with me? And inside, the persons who are providing the service are Nigerian, right? When I first walked in, they thought I was from Nigeria. <laughs> they just started talking to me about the homeland. I, I, huh? Because I got that kind of head. Huh? Then I got that deciduous gap, which is endemic in Nigeria. They just thought I was, huh? Wait a minute, wait. When I went to General Conference in 2012, I looked up at the stage. I was like, that man looked just like me. 
I started walking down. Get out. I walked up to the bishop from Nigeria. Same height, same bald head. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download the picture and put it on the screen. That man could be my daddy. Oh, I'm just hanging out with the Nigerian delegation. Hey, I done found my home. They like, brother, you look just like us. If you are a child of Jesus, you ought to look like him somewhere. You ought to have some of him in your life somewhere. He ought to show up in you. Here, here, Mephibosheth is there at the table. David says to Ziba, Ziba, everything that belongs to Saul now goes to him. Now, let me tell you why that was problematic for Ziba. He'd been staying in Saul's house. It was a, and he says, everything that, and by the way, you and your 15 sons and your 20 servants now work for Mephibosheth. You're going to plant the food and bring it to the house. But from now on, he eats at my table. He eats at my table. He doesn't eat at Saul's table. He eats at my Now, let me tell you from a political position why that was important. To sit at the king's table meant that you had the king's protection. It meant that the people who were at his table, listen to me now, were inviolate in their person or their property. If you were at the king's table, nobody would rob you, hurt you, curse you, talk about you, because you had the king's covering over you. Not only that, they couldn't touch your property because the king had given it to you. Y'all following me here? When you come to this table, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, you belong to the king now. And the world can do you no harm. You belong to the king now. And he will protect you and keep you in every situation and in every circumstance if you come to the table and you humble yourself in the presence of the Lord. Let me move quickly. They would come to the table, Absalom, that was David's favorite boy. He was the one with the long hair. And everybody thought he looked like a king. Solomon, all of his kids would come, and they would sit at the table. And he says, and, and Mephibosheth, you come too. Have you ever been in church and thought everybody else was better? That, that somehow they're living better. They, they got more Holy Ghost than I do. They're closer to God. They know more Bible. They, they know more hymns. They, they just know a lot of, he said, come on to the table where everybody is the same. All right. Now, I'm going to do what preachers do. I'm going I'm I'm to use an imagination now because the text doesn't tell us how Mephibosheth came to the table. Maybe when he first came, he said, I want to go early before anybody else gets there because, you know, folk laugh at me. They point at me. They, they talk about me. So I'm going to get uh, them to take me a little early and get me to the table, and then I'll be there. Nobody will laugh at my brokenness. Nobody will remind me that I'm not like everybody else. I'll just get there, and I'll wait. Maybe. Maybe he said, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll show that I want to be there. I'll just let them take me to the door, and then I'll drag myself. The rest of the way, you, you know, shuffling and, and there. And you know how all the rest of the saints, because you've been to church, they looking like, why are you late? Come on here, somebody. Oh, he, he late every, every time we spoke. Oh, no. If it fits, say out and do better. <laughs> They're laughing at him. But he makes his way to the table. And when he gets there, you, you ever go to a fancy restaurant, you know they have that, have that cloth. And if you got one of them real fancy ones, the waiter will come over and take it out for you. <laughs> you. You ain't never been that kind. Of, and then they fan it out. Drop it right over. Listen. When he got to the table and put his legs under it, and the tablecloth covered, he looked just like everybody else. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've done, what's been done to you. When you come to this table, you are just like everybody else. 
There's no big eyes and small you at the table. There's no special place for them and not you. When you get to the table and put your feet on it, you're at the table of the king. You can eat there and know that everything is well, everything is good, and that you are welcome to the table. Listen. Listen to what the writer says. And he ate at the table like one of the king's sons. He didn't wait for the rest of me. You, you know when you're at home and eating and things, you want y'all to say that quick prayer? <laughs> you know, everybody bow your head, let's say a word of prayer, then we go at it, right? We just going at it, just because we're at home. We're a part of the family. We feel comfortable in this place. And we know that as long as we're at the table, it's a place of safety for us. Let me c- connect the story back to Jesus. John's Gospel, chapter 13, Jesus brings his disciples together at a table that they've been to every year all of their lives. It was a Passover table. It was a meal prepared for them, lamb without a broken bone, herbs and and wine and bread, all their unleavened. And they've done this at least three times before, and Jesus changes everything. He says, tonight, everything is going to be different. Maybe you've been coming to church year after year, first Sunday after first Sunday, but today it can be different. Everything can change for you if you're willing to come to the table and let God change your life. Jesus says, this bread, which we've been eating every year, is no longer the same bread. Now it's my body. Every time you eat this bread, you you are reminded that I gave myself for you. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Wherever you're seated today, whatever you're going through, no matter what your resume, no matter what your rap sheet, no matter what it says in your file, you can be made brand new because today at the table, Jesus has given his body for you. Body broken for you. Body broken for me. You remember what Mephibosheth said? He says, I'm a dog. How do I deserve to sit at your table? I'm nothing. He says, but because I love you, I give my body for you. There they are sitting, and at the Passover meal, there are four distinct cups of wine. I don't know which one he picked up, but in my mind, I think it's the Elijah cup. Somebody say, why that one, Pastor? Because the Elijah cup wasn't drank. It was left there, and there was an empty seat for Elijah because they believed Elijah would come back before the Messiah came. Jesus says, the seat's not empty anymore. I got that seat now. This blood is my blood poured out for you for the remission of your sin. As often as you drink this cup, You do show my death until I come again. Do this in remembrance of me. We can't come to this table like we're at a buffet. Luby somewhere. Got your mind drifting, everything on your mind. Jesus died that you might have a right to the tree of life, and he's inviting you to the table. He's inviting you as a single person. Come to the table. Sit right here by me. He's inviting you, recently divorced, working through that pain and that that sorrow. He's inviting you to his table. He's inviting you if you're on drugs. He's inviting you if you're robbing. He's inviting you if you're stealing. He's inviting you if you're sick. He's inviting you no matter what you're going through. All right. All right. Let me tell you something. Try going to Barack's house. Uh, You you know they do call 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue the people's house. Walk in. Just, just go on and, and roll up in there. Are you with me? Before you go, they're going to background check you. Got a felony, can't get in. Find out you associate with some folk who may be a little shady, can't get in. But Jesus will find you at the crack house bring you out of it and change your life. 
Jesus will find you while you creep it at midnight and take it out of your mind and change. Y'all ain't praying with me. Jesus will find you with the Henny and the Bacardi and change your life. Jesus will find you hitting the cush and come on here, somebody, and change your life. Jesus will change your life. But you can't keep coming up to the table not recognizing that God is inviting you not because of you, but because of Jesus who laid down his life. Oh, I wish you had time to finish the reading the story. David puts Mephibosheth at the table. Things are going good. And then Absalom, his favorite son, rises up in rebellion against his father. And when Absalom is dying and, and he dies and David comes back, Ziba, y- y'all remember him, right? Ziba shows up with a donkey with food, and he says, King, I brought this all to you. When David comes back, he sees Mephibosheth. He says, Mephibosheth, why didn't you go with me? Why why didn't you go? If you read the text, it says Mephibosheth had not cut his hair. He would not washed his face. He would not washed his clothes. He said, King, since the day you left me, I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything because my heart was broken because you were gone. Oh, my legs didn't move, but my heart was with you. Then the king looks at Ziba and says, Ziba, that's not what you told me. You told me Mephibosheth wanted the throne for himself, but when I look at him, I know he's been crying out for me. Then the king says, so I'm going to give everything back. Sometimes you got to get ugly with this thing. Sometimes you might be broke and broken. Sometimes you may be hungry and hungrier. Sometimes you may be alone in the loader bar of your life, but there's a God who loves you, who will come to you and rem- I can't help but tell you the end of the story. Because it, it just got me. It says, and Mephibosheth had a son called Micah. And God bless Micah to have children after children, children upon children. You know why? Because God had made him a promise to Jonathan. There will always be a child bearing your name. Saints, let me tell you, no matter what happens in your life, God hasn't given up on you. No matter what it looks like, no matter the hurt or the pain, God hasn't given up on you. Come to the table. At his table is forgiveness. Lord, we need your forgiveness. At his table is favor. Lord, we need your favor. At his table is courage. Lord, we need your courage to face the day. And at his table, There is love and joy and fellowship and family. Lord, bring your people to your table. Not the way we used to come, but we come with a broken and contrite heart knowing that you didn't have to do it. Maybe today, Lord, there's someone who does not know you. They don't need to know John Wesley. They need to know you. They don't need to know the preacher. They need to know you, Lord. Because they felt so far away from the table and the grace of God, young or old, male or female, no matter where you are, what's going on, at the table, you are the king's child. Maybe today, Lord, there's someone who's looking for a church home. Now, they've been invited to the table, but they've been on the margins for weeks or months or even years. Maybe today they want to come to the table with us, serve God in this place, For his honor and glory, Lord, have your way is my prayer in Jesus' name. God's people said amen. Come on.